extraordinary character study named Hard Eight. Like Sling Blade, it introduces us to a completely original character and then follows him as we wonder what this guy is up to. The movie begins in a coffee shop in Nevada where a well-dressed stranger offers to buy a cup of coffee for a young man who's broke and apparently homeless. What does he want? At first, we're not sure. You come from Vegas, you know? Vegas? You lost some money? No. You won some money. I broke even. What were you playing? Blackjack. You know how to count cards? The older man named Sidney is played by Philip Baker Hall and his new friend John is played by John C. Riley. In a casino, Sidney teaches John how to start with $150 and recycle that same amount of money through the teller cages again and again until the house is convinced he's a high roller and they comp him with a free room. There we are. Good luck. Thanks a lot. Two years go by, Sydney still hangs out in casinos and is still friendly with the young guy, but now there's a woman in the picture, a waitress played by Gwyneth Paltrow. Hello, Captain. Hello again. Do you remember my name? <clears throat> Clementine. That's right. Just like the movie. Exactly. Through John, Sidney meets a new person he doesn't much like. It's an ominous stranger played by Samuel L. Jackson. I saw you playing crap over the original Doom. You uh, bet the hard eight for a thousand and you pressed it for two. Did I hit it? Nah, you didn't hit it. But it was a big bet and I remembered your face. Stupid bet. Hard Eight is not in any way a conventional thriller or crime story. It's a human interest movie, a personality movie, focusing on this older guy named Sidney, who has been around and learned the ropes and doesn't like to make the same mistake twice. This is a great performance by Philip Baker Hall. We've seen him before in Secret Honor, the 1984 Robert Altman film, where he played Richard Nixon on his last night in office. Sidney is a completely different character, but the performance is just as fascinating and makes you realize how shallow and easy to read a lot of movie characters are. Yes, I think that uh, Philip Baker Hall is going to get a lot of work off of this film. If it's seen by the right casting agents and, more importantly, the top flight directors in America, mm -hmm. they will use this guy because he is mesmerizing. Yes. And also, the director has a great technique, and that's showing us that little transactions, like insert shots, basically, yeah. or moves, really mean a lot to people who are desperate. Yes. And that, he makes tension out of somebody handing somebody something. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And that I like, rather than, you know, how do you think make things tense in most American movies? Blow it up or yeah. something like that. And what's interesting here is that everybody doesn't get all involved. In it. There is some action at the action of a sort at the end. Right. But it's not about that. It's about this man who essentially looks as if he'd spent about nine centuries sitting in coffee houses, smoking cigarettes and looking at people, and now wants to give a little advice to a guy and, and, oh, well. and the guy really isn't really smart enough to, to, uh, I, to I think benefit I, from it. I think I know what he's doing, and that's because what he's doing is because he doesn't have a family. Yes. Okay. Coming okay, up that's, next. That's good. Two thumbs up for Hard Eight, the mysterious love and friendship story set in the world of gamblers and bust outs and hookers and johns. Terrific performances by Philip Baker Hall and Gwyneth Paltrow. My thumb, though, keeps revolving to give thumbs up also to another great performance that unfortunately didn't get nearly as much attention. Hard Eight, starring Philip Baker Hall as a mysterious stranger who knows his way around the gambling casinos of Nevada. Listen to me. You listening? You go over there to the slot machines, you go to that woman in the cashier's cage, and you ask her where you can find the floor man. She point to a guy in a tuxedo, the floor man. You find this guy, you approach him, and you say, John Finnegan. So anyway, I just, like, I just flew into town, and, um, you know, I'm going to be playing in this casino. This I is like certainly one of the best performances of the year, as this man takes a down-and-out youngster, played by John C. Riley, and shows him how to build $100 into a reputation as a high roller. You take this $150, you take it to that cashier, and you cash it in for dollar tokens. He'll make a note on the rate card saying the amount you've cashed in the time of day. Hi. Hi. I'd like uh, 150 in dollar tokens. The movie didn't get much distribution around the country, but fortunately it will be out in video stores in a couple of weeks. In a year when I've given four stars to only two new 1997 films, this Hard Eight is obviously one of the best films of the year, and like Yuli's Gold, 
the chosen actor in the right role at the right time. They're both fascinating characters. They're not comparable to other people that's that right. we've yeah. been seen, and that's what makes them stand out. And the nice thing is, you and I both know that if people go to see these two movies, they will not be wasting their time. Not at all. But coming up next, Burt Reynolds and Mark Wahlberg star in Boogie Nights, a portrait of the porno film industry in the 1970s. Are you ready? I know I let you down. My name is Jack. Eddie. Eddie Adams. Eddie Adams from Torrance. Yep. Jack Horner. Filmmaker. Really? Yeah. I make uh, adult films, exotic pictures. Burt Reynolds is a successful porno filmmaker in California in the 1970s, and Mark Wahlberg plays his latest discovery in Boogie Nights, a beautifully constructed, exceedingly well cast, but not all that significant comic drama of the flourishing porno film industry in the 1970s. Certainly, writer-director Paul Thomas Anderson has all of the details and the decor just right. Burt Reynolds is some of his best work ever as the ambitious director. He doesn't push this character at all. He's centered in control, and it's a good job of acting. Good night, dude. Good night, Annie. Good night. Glad you came by. You're great. Thank you. She's the best. She's a wonderful mother, you know. She's a mother to all those who need love. His young protege, played by rap singer turned Calvin Klein model Mark Wahlberg, has been hired for his sexual stamina and his size. You right? Yeah. Okay. You're gonna make your entrance through this door right here. No call to action. That's your cue. You got the lines of the scene? Uh huh. If you drop one, just call. For it. Do not stop. Okay? okay. Do not stop. You want some water or something? No, I'm fine. Okay. Other characters in the porno industry include one played by Don Cheadle. You have to get a new look. Why don't you get a new look? I have a look, okay? The look I have is just fine. What's your look? Chocolate love. All right? I particularly want to praise the casting of this film in Big Rolls and Small by Christine Sheeks. Every role of the large cast is perfectly realized. But as well as Boogie Nights plays at the end of the movie in a sequence that sums up the fate of all the characters. I was left cold, frankly. Their fate seemed arbitrary, and I certainly found no larger meaning in this film. That's why you're getting a positive, to be sure, but mixed review for me. Mixed? Yep. This is on my list of the ten best films of the year. This is a wonderful film. And that last sequence with the yeah. guy throwing the firecrackers? Well, I'm talking about... That was a fab... You've no. got to admit, that's one of the best stretches of film you've ever no, seen. No, no, I, I don't. It but is, isn't isn't what it? I, That isn't what I was criticizing. Okay. Because what I was saying is when we see all of the characters... Well, you know, there isn't a point. You know, there isn't a point. These people are okay. in, a, in a movie that tells a story about a pointless existence. And for a while, they are able to persuade themselves that there is a point, that they're stars, even in this genre. Right. And then at the end, it all comes to pieces again because yeah. drugs destroy of them, course. video destroys them, and the mob destroys them. And they try to go out and, into the real world again, and the, you're really kind of lost. Right, That's the Roger, whole point of well, the film. But wait, Roger, you just said it has no point, and then you told me what the point was. But beyond that, that doesn't isn't enough. This is the kind of... Now, what I want to tell you the want? Wait a second. What did you want? Some kind I of am a... praising the film for its excellence, but it yes. doesn't tell me anything that I didn't know about this world or that, frankly, if I gave you a camera and shot it, I'm talking about mm -hmm. script-wise, not execution. Oh, listen, you can't about, make a film that think good. Think about the Julianne Moore character, this woman who has left her husband and her child who wants That's to a, make it as a point, who is you, really supportive and you've encouraging named a very and, good nurtur character. and nurturing a to the other character. people in the film but can't do anything for herself. That's an talk excellent about character. Talk about Reynolds character. Talk about, I already did. Talk about, I praised well, him. to it, you praised him, but you didn't really give an idea of what a fabulous job he does of trying to keep these sad, I, I, losing, I, I, drifting I, I, I kinds of people together. Him. This movie shows an entire world. It's a sad world. It's an isolated world okay. in which the dreams of stardom nevertheless keep oh, them the going. the dreams of stardom is an old show business cliche, and it happens to be true. It isn't enough to make my ten best list. It's a familiar subject. Two thumbs up for Boogie Nights, which takes the risky subject of adult filmmaking and finds several very human stories in it. It's on my list of the year's ten best. Continuing our show on the best films of the year, number three on my list is Boogie Nights, a film set in the Hollywood porno industry in the late 70s. But the film isn't about sex so much as about people who live in a sort of low-rent parallel universe to the mainstream movie industry. Here's one of the best performances in the movie by Julianne Moore, who deserves an Oscar nomination, I think. She plays a woman who is separated from her family because of her stardom in X-rated films and also because of her drug addiction. 
She's cast to appear with Mark Wahlberg, who is a new discovery of the director, played by Burt Reynolds. And there's a certain gentleness and tact here that's very well conveyed. Are you all right, honey? Oh, this is great. I'm fine. I just, you know, I just want to do good. I just want it to be really good, you know? Um, I was wondering, is it okay if I really try to make it look sexy? Would that be okay? Okay. Great. Clustered around the director, played by Reynolds, is a sort of surrogate family that seeks security and reassurance even as their lives are spinning way out of control. Boogie Nights is the second film by Paul Thomas Anderson, whose Hard Eight was another one of the year's discoveries. On the basis of these first two films, Anderson is a really gifted new talent. I'd put Hard Eight higher on my list uh, than, than this picture. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about, you criticized a couple of my choices for having a predictable arc. I felt that this sort of alternative show business life, this alternative movie life I had been through before, Ed Wood is a better treatment of that, more original, I thought. I gave it a positive review, but not anywhere near what you did. Uh, I, just, I, I, I don't wasn't know that, that it was all that predictable. If you really think about how it ends, of course they're going to get involved in drugs. Of course the porno industry migrates to video, but on the other hand, there were some very strange things that happened at the end of this film that couldn't have been anticipated, including the cowboy who uh, uh, has his dream of, uh, I, I guess of breaking what, out. I guess what I'm saying, Roger, is all the different people on the fringe, that whole element. I, I didn't feel uh -huh. that this film had, quote, higher meaning to it reserve showed the... showed you people you've never seen in the movies before, except in an X-rated movie. Well, no, they sh you showed me characters I've That's seen before. Saying. No, no, characters that I've seen before, character types. Have you ever been hit by lightning? It hurts. It doesn't happen to everyone. It's an electrical charge. It finds its way across the universe, and it lands in your body and your head. William H. Macy stars as a quiz kid turned very quizzical in Magnolia, the new film from Boogie Nights director Paul Thomas Anderson. I'm Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Joyce Kilhaywick, film critic for WBZ-TV in Boston. Hey, Rog. Hey, and now to Magnolia, which I think is one of the best films of the year, and... Certainly one of the most audacious, which is not exactly saying the same thing. It cuts back and forth between several stories that unfold in a rainy Los Angeles, where fathers and children are at war, where love seems impossible, where everyone seems to be half into show business, and where everyone seems to be half dead. One story involves a cop, played by John C. Riley, who falls in love with a woman without seeing her clearly enough to realize she's strung out on drugs. She's played by Melora Walters. You don't know how crazy I am. It's okay. I've got trouble, okay? I'll take everything at face value. I'll be a good listener to you. I started this, didn't I, didn't I? Whatever it is, just say it. You'll see. You want to kiss me, Jim? Yes, I do. Another story, Jeremy Blackman plays a little genius who's under tremendous pressure to win on a game show. Are we going to continue with this game? Yes. Hey, you look at me. Look at me. You are two days away from this record. Okay, nobody's ever done that. You get through this, I'll get you anything you want, anything. Another story, the host of the game show, played by Philip Baker Hall, is dying of cancer. I have about two months. I have no time. Uh, it's in my bones, I don't have a chance. Oh. And still another thread, Julianne Moore's elderly millionaire husband is dying, and she's I'm filled sorry. with regrets. Philip Seymour Hoffman is the old man's nurse. Yeah, I'm gonna turn away and walk away and not look at him. I'm not being my man, my Earl, and um. Uh, Tom, it's okay. I'm okay. Tom, thank you for taking care. And Magnolia also features Tom Cruise as a professional stud who conducts seminars on how to seduce women. Here he is giving a TV interview. Are you close? She's my mother. Yeah, but uh, I mean, she's a woman, too. So, you know, how does she feel about seduce and destroy? I mean, what does she say? <laughs> Well, she says, uh, you go get them, honey. All of these stories are compelling, and some of them are funny, and some of them are very sad. Despite cutting back and forth between them, Anderson is able to build up an uncanny amount of tension and dread in this movie. Magnolia is an urgent film. It's long, but it hurtles ahead through fears and dreams, and then, toward the end, there's a scene of transcendent wonder. A scene so unexpected and arbitrary and inexplicable that it pulls the rug out from under our traditional ideas of narrative and shows that the best laid plans of frogs and men go off to stray. I am so amazed by what you're saying about this movie because it almost seems as though you liked it. 
I loved it. It's on my list of the 10 best movies of the year. Oh, incredible. I'll give you this. Okay. I thought it had a good cast. Yes. I thought, think it has a good filmmaker, yes. worthy themes, parental yes. neglect, the way it damages children and families, but the film is a mess. I really thought that all of these stories would have come together in some sort of unexpected, synergistic way. There would have been some sort of epiphany but Joyce, at the end. That's the and these whole stories don't point. come together, and we're led to think that they will based on the initial little encapsulated that's stories say, at the beginning of the that's film. That's the whole point about the beginning of the film, where we have Ricky Jay narrating this little story about urban legends and strange coincidences and threads that come together and so forth. Exactly. In order to show you at the end of the film that instead of everything coming together the way you're led to think they will, mm -hmm. something utterly unexpected can appear something out of a clear blue utterly sky. Utterly ludicrous. I will only call no this more a, ludicrous a, a than climax anything else. of biblical proportion. Yes, but that it has actually be, happened. It should be. It may have happened. Yes, it actually has it happened. It should be a transforming event. What it transforms at the end is our expectation that every movie has to be dead in the water and be predictable and be formulaic and in the way we expect it to. This it movie is alive and free to surprises. It makes no sense. Big disagreement on Magnolia. Joyce says it's ludicrous. I say it's one of the year's best films. You've only scratched the surface there. I wish we had another hour to talk about it that. It is a great film, and so is Magnolia. Thanks a lot for being here. <laughs> film. Okay, now for the number two movie on my list, Magnolia, which tells a series of interlocking stories in a Los Angeles that seems to be vaguely heading for some kind of biblical apocalypse. The movie was written and directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, whose Boogie Nights took a similar approach to the pornography industry, but now he focuses on aspects of more mainstream show business and the way the city seems haunted by the ghosts of past glories. Here, William H. Macy plays a foolish middle-aged man who was once briefly famous long ago. I'm Quiz Kid Donnie Smith from TV. Might have been before my time. Magnolia is about the way life is arbitrary and accidental, no matter how many plans we make. And it has a brilliantly unexpected conclusion that pulls the rug right out from under all of our expectations. Well, I think I love this movie for the first two hours. I think this guy is enormously talented. And then I think it comes in for an amphibious landing <laughs> that um, blows the whole thing away to me. I think, I think, talk about arbitrary, you begin to think that what he did earlier was arbitrary too, and that is really, uh, that's damaging. To me, the whole heart and soul of this movie is the arbitrary development that you're referring to, yeah. and which we will not reveal. Yeah. Because at the beginning, you have that entire spoken narration by Ricky Jay about coincidences, yeah. about strange urban legends. And I think the message that's percolating beneath the entire film is that all these people are so urgent in their own life and death matters, and what they don't realize is we're part of a gigantic, celestial machine that's wheeling along on its own without any regard at all for what we think the story should be or how it should turn out. Can't argue with that, but I found some of the connections a little arbitrary, more so than they even had to be. Okay, we call our next category Dubious Overachievement, and my nominee is Magnolia. And what's sad is that Magnolia starts great and stays great for two hours. A terrific cast, Julianne Moore, Jason Robards, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Tom Cruise. Wow, the way you have never seen him. And just when you're wondering how writer-director Paul Thomas Anderson can weave all these storylines together, you realize he can't. I, I have so many debts, so many things. I have, I, have, I, have, I have my surgery, my oral surgery coming. What surgery? Oral surgery, a corrective teeth surgery. What is that? Braces. There's one desperate sequence when dying people sing a song, and then a special effect I can't begin to describe that has nothing to do with anything we've seen before that I couldn't watch, literally could not watch. This is not a genius. Well, this is a very talented filmmaker who needs someone like the old-fashioned movie moguls to throw the script back in his face and say, come on, I totally, this, now, this is, is our not biggest, a movie. This is our biggest disagreement on this show. And Paul Thomas Anderson, his previous movie was Boogie Nights, has surpassed himself with this film. And I especially like the very stuff you didn't like, the magic realism that takes place. There was something, I'm not going to give it away, that amazed and delighted me, that was so refreshing that something happened at the end of a movie which was completely consistent with the way it was set up with all of those urban legends, so it was prepared for, and then I'm sitting there, 
seeing something new that I hadn't seen before. Boy, there are a lot, of, kind of, there bizarre are a lot of things you could see that you haven't seen before that I just didn't want to look at. And this was about four million of them dropping from oh, the sky. Okay, well in that case, we disagree on that one. Our first movie is Punch Drunk Love, starring Adam Sandler in a radical departure from his usual brain-dead comedies. And the headline is, Sandler can really act. He's something to behold in this dark and quirky flight of madness from director P.T. Anderson, whose previous work includes Magnolia and Boogie Nights. Here Sandler plays Barry Egan, a disturbed salesman with obsessive compulsive tendencies. His seven sisters have tortured him since he was a little boy. We were calling you gay, and you got so mad you threw the hammer through the sliding glass yeah. door. You remember? I don't remember that. Yes, you do. We were calling you gay boy, and you got so mad. One of Barry's missions is inspired by a true story. He's stocking up on cheap pudding in order to rack up thousands of frequent flyer miles. First I saw the teriyaki chicken for $1.79, and then the soup, which made a real deal. But to stumble across the pudding, it's just tremendous. How most people don't look. They don't look at the fine print, Lance. And that's Anderson favorite Luis Guzman as Barry's co-worker. Another Anderson regular, Philip Seymour Hoffman, plays a scuzzball in Utah who extorts money from Barry after Barry has called a phone sex line. What's your name, sir? You're sick. No, no, no. Shut up! Shut up! Shut, 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 shut up! Are you threatening me? Yes. That wasn't good! You're dead! But Punch Drunk Love is primarily a love story with Emily Watson as the woman who captures Barry's heart. I thought there was a bit of Jerry Lewis in Sandler's performance. He's the pet falling butt of jokes. But there's a fireball of rage churning inside, and woe to those who push him too far. Lit like a Kubrick film and featuring a loopy score, Punch Drunk Love is an oddly funny and affecting journey about two nearly insane people who fall in love. Yeah, I love this film, and I don't think I'll ever be able to look at another Adam Sandler film quite the same way again. I think what Paul Thomas Anderson has done here is deconstruct the character that Sandler usually plays in his movies mm -hmm. and show there's a lot of anger boiling away right beneath the surface. Yeah. The fact that this guy, uh, you know, is so tortured by his sisters and by his life and by his insecurities and by his hang-ups... And he, he tries, he desperately, desperately tries to seem to be pleasant and nice and, and regular. And then he goes yeah. into the bathroom of a restaurant and tears it to pieces. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I he mean, comes back again. It's and a, you kind of feel like that was always what was going on with Adam Sandler. Yeah, there's always been that hint in Sandler that there's more going on. He's like yeah. Robin Williams where you could see him playing even darker characters than this. Oh, yeah. But, you know, he, he knows what normal is and he can see it, but there's like all this glass that he literally has to break through to get to it. But there are little moments of joy, like he has almost a Chaplin-esque dance in, a, in the grocery store when he's stocking up on that pudding. He finds happiness in the strangest thing. This is a really, well, you know, this movie's like no other movie, yet it's, it's really interesting. I want to pick up on something you said. I think he's a very good actor in this movie. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. other serious directors directors could look at him and realize he's got notes that he can play that not every actor can reach. And, and I want to reiterate, we're talking about Adam Sandler yes, here. Yes, yes, who yeah. shouldn't always make Adam Sandler movies. Absolutely. Number seven, I have There Will Be Blood, a tour de force from Paul Thomas Anderson about a ruthless oil man in early 20th century California. What I love about this movie, apart from Daniel Day-Lewis's mesmerizing, terrifying lead performance and Johnny Greenwood's brilliant score, is the picture's uncompromising strangeness. When do we get our money, Daniel? I look at people and I see nothing worth liking. I think with Anderson and with David Fincher, when they make a film, you know it's going to be ambitious, it's going to be different, and even their failures are really fascinating to watch. And in these two cases, with There Will Be Blood and Zodiac, their triumphs are not failures at all. I think it's very heartening that there's still a place for these big, ambitious, daring, yeah. maybe a little bit out of control pictures to Give get Give the big made. canvas and let yeah. it paint, absolutely. Yeah. Much as I admire the craft that went into this year's Oscar winner, No Country for Old Men, it's There Will Be Blood that feels to me like a new American classic. I drink your milkshake. I drink it up! The extras on the two-disc collector's edition include a couple of deleted scenes that make the film's conflicts between capitalism and religion even stronger. Plus, there's a segment showing you old photos and film footage used as reference points by director Paul Thomas Anderson, production designer Jack Fisk, and cinematographer Robert Ellswit 
on their way to completing this one-of-a-kind picture. I really love this film. My next choice is Magnolia, writer-director Paul Thomas Anderson's three-hour epic of intertwined lives over one day in Los Angeles. Anderson sets his film in the San Fernando Valley, where I grew up. And despite the bleak realism he depicts, Anderson infuses a surreal undercurrent that grows as the film builds to a crescendo. He follows nine characters with an excellent cast, including William H. Macy, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Julianne Moore, and John C. Riley. He seamlessly weaves their lives together, including a game show whiz kid, a nerdy LA police officer, and a skittish coke addict. Yes, Stanley. Well, that was in French, and that was from the opera Carmen, and that goes, L'amour est un vaisseau rebelle que nous ne pouvons plus passer. Do you want to come? Is that all right? Tom Cruise does the best work of his career in Magnolia as a cocky self-help guru whose confidence is seemingly impenetrable. You are here for me to enlighten you to edify you, to send you off into the now not-so-unknown future. So come along with me. How to fake like you are nice and caring. Anderson masterfully orchestrates the meltdowns and epiphanies with a propulsive, fluid energy, with Amy Mann's original songs poignantly commenting on the action. Of course, frogs rain from the sky. You're either gonna go with it or you're not. I went with it. Oh, the frogs falling from the sky. Now, I saw Magnolia when I was just starting out as a critic in 1999, and I found it really polarizing. People were either wowed by it, like I was, or they thought it was overlong and pretentious. It's one of the first films that forced me to stand my ground, and here I stand today. <laughs> I'm finished. <laughs>